It says live. I'm not getting any sound from you. Okay, well, let me just. Testing. Can you turn your sound on? Yeah, I'm trying. Here, here. Can audio. you hear me? Edit audio. Okay, well, we're trying to put this together. <laughs> yes. Okay. You got me? That's, can you talk? I can, but you're not. Uh, I'm not getting any sound from. No. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, can't see. Jeez. Hello, testing, one, two. I could hear both of you. Oh, okay. Well, I couldn't hear him. I don't know why. Okay, that's probably why. <laughs> okay, well, here we go. Okay, we're good. We're good. All right, wonderful. I had to come in and out again. Yeah. All right. I wanted to get more clarity on the Scythianos issue because we that's a, that's, history, you know. Yeah, it's well, it's not every day I run into somebody who's done an in-depth study of one of the most obscure topics that Rudolf Steiner happens to bring up. And well, so yeah. Let me let me let me start the podcast. Let's do a pause of silence and I can clip it off later. Oh good. Okay. Okay. Go for it. Well, hello everybody. My name is John Barnwell and I'm here in Detroit. The Straits. Detroit. And I'm here with the eminent uh martial arts instructor and, and physical discipline educator and author Robert Allen Pittman, who, like myself, has for a great many years studied and attempted to unlock some of the uh, spiritual science that was given to the world by Rudolf Steiner around 100 years ago. And, uh, but in our last podcast, he was at Tintagel and the old Arthurian uh, Iron Age mystery center that was established that Rudolf Steiner talked about specifically when he came to England. And uh, But there's certain aspects of that story that came up that we realized we had to carry it further. And that had to do with the great initiate Scythianos, who's one of those leaders of mankind leading all the way back to ancient Atlantis. And uh, Rudolf Steiner indicates how Scythianos was responsible for establishing certain important mystery centers to provide a continuation from the mysteries of the ancient world, uh, the mysteries of the Sun Mystery Center specifically in Atlantis. But then that stream separated off. And so you have two uh, migratory streams coming out of ancient Atlantis, that, which would be like oh, about 
well, between 50, 10,000 years ago, there was this, this climacteric event. With the sinking of Atlantis, the Isle of Ireland is a remnant of that ancient continent, in, in, according to uh, Rudolf Steiner. And so it's interesting in that Robert was able to share some of the recent uh, discoveries in Tintagel that once again support the indications of Rudolf Steiner as being correct. And within that is embedded that whole uh, story of Scythianos, the leader that literally traveled uh, throughout the globe in different incarnations and provided input into developing the mystery wisdoms in the centers of various cultures. So we're going to discuss some of that, which is not something that comes up too often. And he, but he happens to be in in Warrington right now. He's he's in what Cheshire is that? That's in Cheshire, isn't it? This is Lewis Carroll Country. Actually, is uh, part of Old Wales. This is part of the Northwest. It's actually part of Wales in the old days, and we're near the town of Chester, which was uh, in the time of the Iron Age, Arthur, probably the largest fortified city in the UK, London was a village. So this part of the country was uh, extremely important at that time. And the walls of Chester are still intact and they still have a town crier and the accompanying town of Ribchester has uh, uh, the excavations for all the Scythian armies that came through to uh, assist the Romans. So there's some interesting entrenched history in this region uh, in spite of its terribly urban exterior. There's some great archeological stuff. And luckily, uh, Mark Ali can kind of pilot me through the left-handed driving and uh, I can manage all that stuff. What I wanted to bring up, John, was um, this idea that there was a stream of energy around the planet uh, that we would say comes, if you're using Switzerland as Central Europe, it's coming from the Northwest and forming a sort of spiral around the planet. And it's not the only stream, but it's one of, of many energetic signatures. And it's the one that Steiner indicated carried the influences of, of Scythianos and of the mysteries of the physical body. And because he stipulated uh, Northwest, I got interested in reverse engineering my studies in Chinese martial arts and Indian yoga and spiraling back up around the globe toward, uh, toward Scandinavia. And uh, that took me up to uh, Finland and uh, I didn't expect to get up that way. And I haven't been up there. I've been up as far as the, fin, the Finnish occupied forest of Norway. I've got a few hints from the uh, retired uh, Norwegian healthcare authority minister who's a strong anthroposophist. Uh, she's Finnish and she's retired. I went to see her in Finnskog in the Finnish forest. We had a long talk on more than one occasion between bites of apple pie and terribly dark coffee. And uh, she told me that uh, the Finns had very certain characteristics because I was interested in what I needed to know about them as a, a culture personality before I went there. And she recommended three different churches to visit representing the three different streams of denominations of Christianity to get a taste of what the Finns do to things. Uh, I haven't been up there yet to do that, but in line with that was when I went to see Oscar Hansen before he passed away, and our host, and um, Dr. Hansen, when I told him that I was interested in the physical body, uh, first he proceeded to tell me that Stalin was intelligent enough to court the favor of the Finns, because he considered their strategic alliance extremely important. And he wanted me to understand the depth of that statement. 
And so I went back to World War II and I, I hacked around a little bit there and had a look at what was going on. And then I came back to, in my mind to this idea of the Finns being an extremely significant hinge to certain cultural influences. What Dr. Hansen had said was Steiner gave a lecture on uh, the Kalevala, which is uh, a sort of compiled set of legends that were gathered fairly recently, 1800s, uh, but represents some extremely ancient ideas that fermented and grew to vintage status in Finland. So when Steiner lectured on the Kalevala, he did something very interesting. He wrote the name of Scythianos at the bottom of the lecture. And Dr. Hansen wanted me to notice that. And he said, you know, Steiner talked about the Kalevala, but he mentioned during the lecture Scythianos. So he said, I think basically to put it in my paraphrase, you should bird dog that, that hint. And so I thought, okay, we really need to cross-reference the Finns with their neighbors. And Steiner said the Finns were the priests, the Norwegians were the farmers, and the Swedes were the royal houses. And so I got the hunch that the Finns had a kind of shamanism, had a kind of spirituality that was endemic to their cultural nature. And, uh, you know, Finnish is a kind of Hungarian and the Norwegians for the life of themselves can't figure out how they managed to cross the country without being caught. So there's this enigma of how they got up there, maybe through the water. Um, at any rate, they're there and they're accompanied with the Sami people who basically traverse the, the pole going back and forth from Russia to Finland. And so Finland is sort of this matrix of what I would describe as a, a sort of tripartite influence. If you can imagine a Triskel or three things coming into Finland, you've got the Russian influence, and then you've got the Hungarian influence, and you've got the Norwegian influence, and there's the Kalevala, which is their, more or less what we have of their oral tradition. <coughs> And uh, if the readers or the listeners want to do a little more research on getting a sense of it, there's a wonderful old Russian film called Sampo on YouTube, and it tells the Kalevala story. And uh, it's done in quite an archetypal fashion. It's quite fascinating, and I like to watch it on occasion to remind myself of the basic elements of the story about Vainomainen. Um but looking at the uniqueness of what the Finns have to offer as a culture, I'd like the listeners to, to think in terms of most cultures having a legendary spear. You know, if we've done martial arts, we know the importance of weaponry. A lot of arts, the choreography is weapon defined and the body is habituated and then they drop the weapon and you have a kata or you have an empty hand form, most of which is derived from weapon movement, which has been habituated because of the necessity of having a tool. Well, what's interesting about the Finns is they, they, uh, they have some uh, important weapons in the Kalevala, but the interesting thing and the, the most, probably the strangest thing about their main character is he uses the word as the weapon and he uses singing as a weapon. And he sings people into oblivion. There seems to be this running knowledge of uh, some sort of strange hypnosis. It's like they understood the media before the media was formed. And when Vainamainen is threatened, he will say, you do not threaten me, I will sing you into the darkness or I will sing you into uncreation. And it, it's really uh, a fascinating shift from I'm going to conquer you with the sword or I'm going to cut you up or spear you or thrust you or capture you or torture you. No, I'm going to sing you to death. So if you don't die of boredom, you die of resonance. So there's something very, very unique in the Finnish culture about the power of the voice 
And I wanted to throw that out to you and let the listeners know that too, because they can go and listen to Finnish music on YouTube and they'll hear something really spectacular and subtle. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I just wanted to comment uh, that Sergei Prokofiev, the great Russian anthroposophist who was uh, a member of the Vorstand or the Central Committee of uh, the Vorstand in Dornach, Switzerland, was Russian. He's the grandson of the composer Sergei Prokofiev. But he made the comment, and I don't have the reference in front of me because I didn't no, of course we were going to go there, but it's in it's in his book uh, on Eastern Europe and the future mysteries of the whole spiritual origins of Eastern Europe and the future mysteries of the Holy Grail, which yeah. is probably the most extensive treatment of Scythianos done by any anthroposophist. But in there, he makes the point of that the Russian word uh, for the Finns means strange you know, or unusual, you yeah. know. So there was, this, uh, there was a certain uh, respect that the Finns had in the eyes of the Rus. And, and so, yeah, it, it lines up with the idea that they're the priesthood, and then you have the Swedes or the royals, and then you have the agriculture uh, amongst the Norwegians which is really interesting because it was the Norwegians primarily that when you talk of the Normans uh, and, and that whole incursion into Normandy, yeah. uh, it, would have been a, it was a Norwegian uh, reaching out, really. And mm. of course, looking for agricultural land really is what they're, they're working on. That's their, their itinerary, so to speak. And like when they came, the incursions into England, and, and Ireland, a uh, mixture of the, the uh, Norwegians and the Danes primarily. So it's interesting, these migrations, but what you say about that whole idea, that's like this magical uh, potency that they have being uh, the, essentially the priesthood. And, and so this is something that no doubt lives in the memory of, of the folk culture of the Slavs going back into the night of time. Yeah, I would, I would think, you know, when they recite the Kalevala, the old way of doing it uh, was for two men to sit on a bench and hold hands facing each other. And they rock back and forth. And the Kalevala's in, uh, I think it's in triplets. And one recites one side, the other recites the other. And they are not one verse amplifies the first. For instance, they'll say, you know, it was uh, it was on the dark dark sea that it formed, and the next phrase might be, in the deep darkness formed even darker than the sky in the winter, and so they build in uh, in triple form in the poetry, so that you're slowly and really hypnotically taken into another state. And if you read, read it out loud, you'll find the, the conditions for a sort of optimism are, are implicit in the Kalevala. If you read it out loud, even in translation, it will still carry you into, into the poetic sense extremely fast. And if you realize that when men recited it, they had eye contact, they were holding hands like they were rowing a boat together. So their breathing was synchronized. The poem was already memorized. And so there was a cadence and uh, there was a solidity and a rhythm and the heartbeats had a sort of seagoing activity from, from the activity of rowing the boat. So they would even do this when they recited it on land sitting on a bench. And I think it allowed the preservation of certain things in the memory. Go ahead. Well, you could look at that more than just like uh, entertainment, the way people look at things today. It's so, so much on the surface, but that it was really an invocation that they were mm -hmm. doing, that yeah. they were participating 
in something that was very uh, special. It's, it's akin to the mass and the Eucharist, is that there's something happening that has a magical potency. And I can attest to that because I've been healed through taking the Eucharist before, you know. I, and so the, these things, <clears throat> if you look at what Rudolf Steiner says regarding the, the cultures of the North, he talks about the development of the sentient soul in ancient Egypt and Babylon and in Chaldea and, and for the 2160 year uh, age of Taurus. But then when it goes into the age of Aries for 2160 years, it's at 747 BC, then it goes into the, the Greco-Roman period. And so, in the ancient Egyptian Babylonian, you have the sentient soul. In the Greco-Roman period, you have the intellectual soul, mm -hmm. which ended in 1413, 1414. So now we're in the, the epic of the consciousness soul, or yeah. but which in the future will be transformed into the spiritual soul in, in right. preparation for this, the, the sixth greater period coming up, which would be pointing towards uh, the Slavic region, you know, that, yeah. they're, that they're carrying something regarding the future evolution of mankind, but we're not there yet. And no. so when you get into looking at this a little more closely, you could see that the intellectual soul culture was taking place in the Mediterranean region and there was high developments and in intellectual culture and all of that. But yet up in the north, it maintained this kind of magical relationship to nature. And, and so Ruta Steiner does talk about the, the northern mysteries uh, like that are in the, in the uh, other writings of the north with the mysteries of, of Siegfried and Sig and, and all of that. that he said that those mysteries that were established there by Scythianos, that they transmitted uh, their mysteries through music. And yeah. so they they would sing and, and play music, and, and that's how they shared the stories. And he said what that did was that developed within those people uh, a gift in the realms of mathematics and music. And so if you look at Northern European culture, you say, what, what is their big thing? And you say mathematicians and musicians. I mean, you look at like Beethoven, Mozart, Chopin, uh, mm -hmm. Grieg, uh, there's a, there, there's just this tremendous orchestral music that develops out of that innate capacity, and which ties again into that whole idea of Scythianos and the mysteries of the physical. This is what we want to explore here, which is really, really a truly deep subject. And well, it also lucky to have a gentleman here that knows a lot about it. Well, it's it's uh, interesting to me because what it what it points out to me is. Uh, something uh, very substantial. There's several things that came to mind while you were talking. One was each culture has its turn to bring its gift over time. And a lot of people are not taught in school that cultures actually each bring a gift to civilization at different times in history. And there's a sequence and there's a progression if we were taught that in history classes, all of history would begin to take on form and meaning. And uh, this, of course, relates to the role of the archangels and their dispositions overshadowing these windows of history. Uh, what's his name? Uh, I think it's Emil Pallas, the Hungarian who wrote about the seven archangels and had his graduate students cover those 350 year periods extremely scrupulously only to find they indeed did show patterns that resembled the dispositions of the medieval archangels. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the actually the whole second half of my first book, The Arcana of the Grail Angel, yeah. I, I deal at length with the, the archangelic periods as described by Rudolf Steiner, who was building upon the doctrine that was left by Abbot Trithemius, who was the teacher of Paracelsus and also 
uh, Cornelius Agrippa, von Nettersheim. And so you have it's really uh, an important aspect of that esoteric Christian stream to be able to come into a relationship with the, the time understanding. And when you get, like, for example, like uh, Irenaeus and his influence on the development of Bible, insisting that there be four Gospels. Yes, but there was a cosmic understanding behind all of this, and you yeah, go to the cathedral. Frequency, numerology, and math. Yeah, you go to go to see the cathedrals, and what do you have there? You have the four gospels portrayed by their their uh, astronomical, astrological symbols. So you have the bull of Taurus, and you have the lion of Leo, and the eagle of Scorpio, and then the angel of uh, Aquarius, and, and what is that? Well, that's that's uh, the bull is is Luke, and the lion is Mark, and the eagle is Saint John, and then Saint Matthew is represented by that angel, the angel of synthesis. See, so that you, you have this this fourth uh, modulating the three, and Rudolf Steiner gets into an interesting description about that because he says that. In, in, in the esoteric paper somewhere, I forget where exactly where it is, but he talks about the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes. Mm -hmm. And he gets into describing how uh, the, the Sadducees represent a certain relationship to the, the will aspect of the activity and the Pharisees with, with like that whole literal intellectual soul pursuit so that the the uh, will aspect is the consciousness soul that's the sadducees the the intellectual soul is the pharisees yeah following the literal text and then the third impulse is the essene and that that's the sentient soul and he says actually the essene should be the one modulating the other two and so you see that, that there's this whole translation of what you were just saying about the gifts from uh, different cultures interweaving. And although we are in the consciousness soul period, the transformation of the consciousness soul into the spiritual soul takes place through this modulation, through the ability of that Essene archetype be able to modulate between the Sadducees and Pharisees. Yeah, and you know each of those groups, they they each have a different, a different anticipation and a different description of what they thought the Messiah would be, and it's only the Essenes that disappear after the birth of Christ. So it's safe to assume he met the criteria for them, but he did not meet the criteria for the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, the other thing uh, about cultures and epochs uh, as if we look at history as a dawning consciousness and different cultures making deposits in time to create different potentials in the human being there's a tendency to leave out the eccentric person in other words we tend to see the masses being baptized in trends and ideas and fashions over the millennia. But the interesting thing is to me, within each big wave, there's microwaves, there's little waves. So if you study wave theory, you have a wave like a surfer's wave. If you magnify the edge of that wave, you'll see little tiny corners of data or little miniature waves. So a big wave can carry lots of little waves. And I'm interested in, in the little waves because I'm interested in individual people. And sometimes they have to do things that don't flow with the trend or don't appear to flow with the trend. And I think this is due to uh, certain kinds of karma in which they have to resolve certain things within themselves. And uh, I, when I talk to uh, anthroposophist John, Sometimes I'll talk to them about a tradition and they'll look at me and they'll say, well, that's all outdated now. We don't need that. We've evolved beyond that. And I have to bring up the fact that people are not all at the same place spiritually and we're dimensional beings. And some of us have to go back to the past to pick up something that we forgot 
or that we have not resolved yet. And so there's a very um, real reason for people to study ancient things and other cultures outside their own in order to resolve certain things in themselves that will allow them to get on the bigger angelic wave. I think that's very important that we uh, allow people to go back and to also do things that are seemingly incongruous because they must do these things to substantiate susp suspicions in themselves and consolidate what they are and who they are in their mission. So that's my sermonette of, uh, sermonette of the day on the role of eccentrics and these gigantic uh, macrocosmic waves we're talking about. Yes, well, you get into a uh, further look at what Rudolf Steiner had said regarding the actual configuration of, of the human body. And there's reference that he made to uh, during the Archangel, Archangelic period of Gabriel, which preceded uh, the age we're currently in, which is the age of Michael. And that that the age of Michael happened in November of 1879. And before that period, he said that, uh, of course, uh, Gabriel is considered to be the archangel of the forces of the moon. And so it has to do with uh, the birth mysteries and in coming to understand those mysteries, it also has to do with the the configuration of, of the actual human form. And he'd said that the archangelic uh, period of Gabriel was when it was taken up to, to modify the center right here in the brow. And he said that it, it was a reconfiguring to be able to take up the, the new impulses that were to come through Michael, but that if people didn't take this up, that that it would basically atrophy or just kind of uh, wither away, but that there was an innate, it's, it's kind of like, uh, it makes me think of like a, a, the shape that, that plays into antennas, you know, is that, that there's this, this certain restructuring. And he said that were you to compare uh, the anatomy of a uh, current human being with somebody from the Middle Ages, you'd be able to detect the actual variations in the, the configurations uh, of the brain. And so you see that you have this, this uh, instrument that it will enable you, and again, we're in the consciousness soul period, so we're having to do with the most physical of the relationships to the physical world that we've established in a certain regard so that you have being able to firmly make the connection in this world and out of that, that we bring forth through our own strivings and create this bridge into uh, the future development of consciousness. Because the, the, the clairvoyant capacities of the past were gifted to us from the divine spiritual powers, and it became something that darkened. And right. Rudolf Steiner does talk about that in the uh, initiation lecture cycle, those four lectures. Yeah, um, it's important not to fall into old activism. When I'm talking to people who are not so Steiner friendly, I'll just say, we're living in the time when if you're serious, stuff has to make sense. And that's my cliff notes for the intellectual soul. We're at a point where we got to be able to make sense of this stuff. And I'll just say, it doesn't it make sense? Does it make sense? And they'll say, no. And I'll say, well, don't you want it to make sense? And they'll say, well, sometimes, you know, but it's a little frightening because there's so much stuff to try to make sense of. Uh, but we are in the, in the era when we need to make sense of things. And in order to grow, we have to know. And so this, this is our time to do that. Uh, it's not the time to fall into trances, leave your body and go talk to disincarnate beings. It's the time to be here now in the immortal words of Ram Das and uh, get with the program. Or, you know, my school kids used to say, see you at the beach. You know, it's time to show up. So we have to be here, make sense of it. 
and and we've got we got the brain to do it, but we're very distracted and we're very submerged by propaganda. So we really have to create our own our own linkages, and try to find people who have large enough maps to accommodate the present difficulties and waveforms that we have dancing around us all the time. So map making is a huge thing. You know, I at one time my job was making uh, groundwater maps for a uh, for a company that would reclimate soil. And so they used to drop wells in the ground and uh, take measurements of the water table. And then they would come in with these uh, statistics for me and I would get the geology maps and I would show the movement of groundwater beneath the subsurface dimensionally based on levels of toluene, benzene, all these uh, pollutions that come from service stations because most of our work was reclamation of service station lots. And so I eventually it kind of leaked into me that uh, there's stuff going on underground in different directions with different levels of toxicity and nutrition. And then I began to look at people that way too. And then I thought, well, there's all sorts of substrates and there's geology of the earth and there's geology of the human. And there's irrigation of the earth and there's irrigation of the human. So it made things more substantial to me having that job. And I got a sense of uh, technology, pollution, and the human being uh, frolicking on the surface of the planet on this very thin green membrane that we, we live on. Uh, I'm not too worried about people destroying the planet because uh, they're very tiny. And it's a very, very thin membrane that we exist on. We're, we're really tiny, tiny creatures on a very big planet. And I, I think a lot of people don't realize how to <clears throat> I think it's an important thing to study scale and proportion. Thank God for the ancient Greeks. You know, at least they gave us, they gave us that. Anyway, <laughs> my side. What's next? A little more on Scythianos, maybe. Well, wait, I, but I, you know, we got to include some of the human interest stories. You talk <laughs> about maps, you know, and yeah, and I used to, uh, I don't, I don't think I told you this story last time, but uh, I used to work with this, this elderly gentleman, uh, Donald Gautier, and he was, he was a French uh, engineer and he had this, this, he owned several homes right next to the hospital in Detroit, and he was he was given that plot of land for the duration of his life by a mandate from a uh, presidential mandate. Okay, and it, the the reason that that happened was that he won the contract for making the Norden bomb site. Okay, and yeah. they were they were actually manufactured in this basement that I was working in, you know, and <laughs> which is famous uh, for the Allied efforts during World War II, right? But he uh, he collected uh, maps, and he had these maps that were made by uh, the Jesuits in, in canoes traveling around Michigan and ma and mapping it out and using sight lines and all that, and they. had He'd show me how what a great job they did. I try to imagine drawing a map of Michigan from a canoe, right? And, but they had actually pulled it off section by section, and he had all these the actual maps, you know. And so, uh, human ingenuity is 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 quite tremendous. And you look at the the capacities of uh, the long ships of the Vikings and their ability to travel and, and with their shallow drafts so that they could go far up rivers and all of that. And so the, the human ingenuity is just uh, incredible the way it's it's filtered down through all these various cultures. And like you say, yeah, they all have gifts to give. It's underrated. You know, it's very popular now to blame the extraterrestrials for interfering, but they're not giving enough credit to the humans. Humans are very canny creatures. And uh, they understood numerology, numerics, geometry, tremendous instincts. Uh, the, the, you know, the, there's some cathedrals did fall down before they got it right. But when they got it right, they really got it right. 
And uh, I think I think there's a tendency to, to downplay and underrate the amazing uh, canny human wisdom in, uh, in astronomy and astrology and uh, architecture. And uh, mapping is one of those things. And uh, and mapping doesn't exclude remote viewing because these people were traversing a period of time when shamans did a lot of disembodied viewing of things. So I think quite often the mapping could have easily been cross-referenced through uh, geometry as well as vision, as well as second sight. And I think if you look at the ingenuity of the ancient peoples, they, they left very little room to guesswork because they were survivors. So I think it's important to, uh, to give the human being full shrift on what their capacities were. And I don't think this is quite uh, made it into the popular mind yet since it's very popular to run to the, the ETs for intelligence. Still a tendency to look at a human being as a smart monkey when in reality, the monkey could be a devolved human rather than a step along the way. And the evidence can quite point that way as well, although it's not popular in the propaganda of National Geographic and the, the leaky, the very leaky, leaky streams. Go ahead. Oh, mute volume. Oh, sorry, I was, uh, I, I was ducking out. I wanted to, you're one of the only people I know that is aware of this book, The Psychometal <laughs> Complex of the Oh, Tumors. It's extremely important for anyone interested in the history of shamanism. By Shira Gokharov. Yeah, Shira Gokharov uh, lived with the Tungus in the, at a time when they were the shamans were still fully active and living it out. And it wasn't long ago. And that's been translated into English and, and it's there's a free edition somewhere on the web if if people want to really look at shamanism in its uh, historical and cultural context, not as some new age fluffy poodle flying around. But the the uh, the Tungu, they have periodic meetings where the shaman will all come together and but they don't have a mail service, right? And they don't have telephones. And they just, they would all show up. Well, how do they all know to be there, right? Yeah. I mean, it's 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 a total attestment. And and Shigokarov, he was, it, he marveled at this. It's like how in, how in the world could they travel hundreds of miles, uh, each of them, and then get there and meet together at the same time? <laughs> it it just uh, it proves that, that that there's something super sensible going on. Oh, there's more than one, there's more than one super sensibility. You know, when Ingo Swan was doing remote viewing at Stanford with his, uh, with uh, Hal Putoff and Russ Targ, they were able to classify for the army, I think over 20 different senses in the human being. Besides the five, I think it, they brought it to about 23 senses. It's called the psychomental complex of the Tungus. I saw that question come up uh excellent excellent book on shamanism you got to have the patience for it you might be able to get it on interlibrary loan originally it was a big massive dictionary like book um anyway yeah the tungus they they're still intact you know the russians they've unionized the shamans and so they actually protect them and if they find someone who's a functioning shaman healer, like in uh, Tuva, they actually have a little wallet card that says shaman, blah, blah, grade, protected by, as a national trust. Uh, Robert Amaker is, uh, he's passed away a couple of years ago. He was a Taiji teacher, but he was also a drummer who spent about 20 years in uh, tabla study and then another 20 in African drumming study. He ended up with the skin drum in Tuva and uh, he thought he was going there to sightsee and maybe teach some Taiji. And one of the healers came up to Robert Amaker and said, I want to thank you for coming to heal us. And he said, what are you talking about? 
Now, this is this autism and this clairvoyance we're talking about, John. He said, I want to thank you for coming to heal us. And Robert said, no, no, no. I'm a Taiji teacher, and I just do a little drumming. He said, no, no, you've come to heal us. Start drumming, please. And Robert, he just, he was at the museum for the shamans, and he sat down, and he started drumming. They kept him in that museum for three days, drumming. And the other shamans came out of the forest in a three-day period and filled the museum and surrounded it. And they said to Robert Amaker, we're hearing the voices of our ancestors and we're so grateful to you. And uh, when I saw Ro Robert, I said, well, are you gonna go back? He said, hell no, hell no. He said, I hardly got to eat. <laughs> but you can go on Robert Amaker's site, it's White Crow Tai Chi, White Crow Tai Chi. Robert was a fantastic character God rest his soul. But he met the very people we're discussing now and was accepted by them and found himself put into a role he did not expect. And this goes into uh, a kind of consciousness that even those of us working with the consciousness soul, uh, we have to be willing to realize that um, in the angel making factory of God and the gigantic food chain of the universe, sometimes we are slid into position and we have to learn when to sense we're being placed there with a purpose. And, yeah, uh, if you get into what Rudolf Steiner says about the, uh, the future and the, the uh, evolutionary development of mankind when we move into the next great uh, age that the, this Slavic soul period is, is, he said, when we get to that point, we won't need medicines. It's like, right. it's like wow. You know, I mean, I, I don't know if they allow you to say that, I, I, but we're not in direct competition with what's going on today because that's in the future, but it has to do with the, the nature of the human being and how it can transform through in its evolution. And by taking up the task of being able to irradiate the new center that's been formed in the head by the Archangel Gabriel to receive the Michaelic uh, cosmic intelligence is how Rudolf Steiner describes it. And well, he, talks, he talks about that the archetype uh, for this is, is portrayed by Wolfram von Eschenbach in, in the uh, story of Parsifal and that yeah. the, the epic of Parsifal of the ninth century, that takes place during the age of the intellectual soul. And you see in the story itself, he goes through the sentient soul and that it's for the intellectual soul, but that what Parsifal does is he actually achieves the initiation of the consciousness soul, which is... Yeah. The, the initiation of the future so that he was able to consolidate the, the manner and form of that soul configuration for the next culture. And so that these things are, are gifted uh, to mankind through the, the strivings of, of great initiates. And that's yeah, the important agree, thing. You have to understand. And, and, you know, Parsifal was one of the knights. I think the other knights achieved other things. And those are also other uh, doorways to open and go down and uncover the function of the, the grail quest in regard to human consciousness and what each knight had to achieve. In the Parsifal story, which is the easy one to access because we, we have it and we have it in some detail, uh, the names of, I'm convinced the names of the, the men he, conquers. I'm convinced that this list of names has great meaning. I haven't, un I haven't defined it and picked it apart with Eurythmy, but I'm convinced that each person he encounters is a particular lesson in a particular craft or form of knowing. And so the names are extremely important because he's passing through stages as he conquers each one. And they're knights of very particular features. There's one knight that has an armor and the helmet is made out of crystallized salt. And uh, you can run with that. 
because that what that implies as far as the brain, the pineal gland, and the bloodstream is, uh, of course, uh, a litany. But each one, each one of the beings or the knights that Parsifal encounters, there is there is some characteristic cited, or there's something within the name. So, I think we're really just at the beginning of can opening what we have as far as these stories and legends and the metaphors and the instructions that are latent inside them. It's a very huge uh, trove of uh, wisdom. Oh. If you get into uh, this particular volume, the occult truths of myths and legends, Greek and dramatic mythology, Richard Wagner in the yeah. light of spiritual science. And that's something that's be made available. Uh, that's Collected Works Volume 92. But Excellent. in there, he gets into explaining uh, a great deal uh, of the content. And it's interesting what he says about Richard Wagner, because Wagner, Riddlesteiner says that he was he was as dedicated to, to his mystical uh, quest as anybody at that time, which which is a pretty interesting uh, comment to make, you know. Well, you know, with the problem, you know, when people bring up Hitler and then they whitewash German culture and then you hear nothing about Central Europe after World War II, the whole thing has been blinked out in literature courses. And it's such a disservice to thinking human beings. But if we look at Wagner, it's obvious in his operas. He's trying to take you through a transformative experience. They're very prolonged. And the tones and the music and the incredible soaring renditions, renditions of, of, of uh, the songs and then the uh, amazing almost Star Wars-like sets, these vast archetypal sets and settings. Uh, we forget that most of our space opera came from real opera and, uh, and Wagner really championed it, but he was actually after transforming people. And this is all whitewashed and he's, he's looked at as pastiche or He's looked at as over dramatic or dull, but in reality, the man was actually trying to do something very good. And this is not cited, nor is it spoken about, but there's plenty spoken about to tear him down or to make him look small, which is always the mark of a remarkable human being. I'm going to have to go to the floor to put my phone on charge, but I'll continue the conversation. <laughs> Uh, I'm in my seaman's cabin, basically in my room here, and I have to work with. Uh, I have to work with uh, technology I have where I am. I'm used to making do, but it's a task. <laughs> but yeah. I feel I feel like Wagner needs a needs a real fair shake, and he's not been given one because of uh, World War Two and because he's always connected to Hitler, and you know he. Yeah, which is really, if you get into Richard Wagner himself, it's fascinating because at the end of his life, he was working on uh, a uh, Hindu and Buddhist uh, Go ahead. Uh, opera, right? Yeah. That, and that uh, it was very redemptive for him. Yeah. And, but, he... but some of it got taken up by people within the German military, and so he gets a bad rap. But he yeah. was extremely conscientious and, and in that he uh, was very much an activist in trying to transform uh, the culture of Germany and to bring it to a, a, a more developed uh, stage. And so it's, yeah. it's interesting when you look into him as an activist, actually. Actually, yes, and also if you look, as I recall, he was also working with Edward Shure. And and for me, Edward Shure was very big potatoes at that time. I I was diving into Edward Shure in my twenties, and it was actually Shure that took me back to Steiner. Uh, and it was because I was reading from Sphinx to Christ. And 
it was Shure that really shone a, shone a light on how each religion brought a certain amount of light to humanity at a certain time. And when I saw that, that latter sequence, that stair step sequence, I became very much more interested in historic patterning and what yeah. happened as, as a waveform through history and which, which figures seem to repeat. Well, that's a, it's what's part of what's so interesting about Rudolf Steiner is how he is able to take that which was of value in the theosophical movement and transform it. Because instead of uh, having like this whole thing about the root races and sub races and all that, he changed it. He changed it to cultural ages. And he gets into a, a more developed uh, description of that. If you spend enough time in the body of his work, you'll find that really. He, he gets uh, greatly into showing how the folk soul and the environment in which the culture is, is located plays into the metamorphosis and the nature of that, that cultural manifestation. And so it's interesting. And he gets into talking about the folk souls of, the, of various nations like France. Yeah. And, and uh, France is like the water. Uh, element and so you have their deriving their 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 uh kinghood story leads back to melusina the water spirit right and well and she's connected to witches and sirens and there's yes. even a, there's even an extensive comic book in in france you know comic comic literature is huge in france they had graphics novels long before we had them in america but melusine has her own comic and uh, <laughs> My stepdaughter used to read them. There were stacks of them. So yeah, I, I, and and, and uh, Rome is the, is the is the eagle, right? Because it's that element of, of air, and then you have the warmth element in the, in the northern uh, Germanic people. So that that you have that idea of that it, it's it's a young culture because our youngest member is our ego. That was the last. Uh, uh, of the primary principles of the human being to be added was the ego was donated through the agency of Christ, the logos, through the, the uh, exousiae spirits of form that all mankind was participating in this, this true ego nature. And that that's how we receive our greatness. And that's, that's the, the point of this configuration is to be able to come into relationship of this, where uh, Rudolf Steiner describes elsewhere as curios, that it means Lord, and that the Lord is that, that true ego, higher ego nature of which our personalities, just like this kind of uh, dull reflection on, on the screen of, of, of what's going on, and that we're not even, aware you know you're not making your heartbeat you don't i don't think you think you are you're I not making you your blood flow but yet some, curios is yeah john if someone swings in from the periphery as steiner would say i think it's important to realize that what the word translated as ego in steiner's work is ick and it means individuality or essence it does not mean freud's ego and this is created a tremendous amount of confusion uh, that it, it's not it's not Freud's ego it's the individuality the I am of the person it's the crystallization of the personality of something hyper individual this is uh, this has been our evolution and this is just where we're starting to hit uh, as far as getting traction yeah the uh it's important to keep in mind that, that the German word ich uh, is I-C-H, and it's the initials of Jesus Christ, and that it was uh, uh, Uphilas, the, the Gothic, uh, he, he's the one who co converted the Goths and created the Gothic uh, language, and that the word for I, uh, they didn't have a word for I, he created one, right? right. And, and used right. the initials of the name of Jesus Christ. Well, that shows the consciousness changed at that time. You know, the American detective writer, uh, Raymond Chandler, he said, everything happens in the poetry first. And uh, 
he wrote an essay on the simple art of murder, which is pretty fantastic about uh, the necessary redemption a hero requires so that he doesn't match his surroundings. Um, but this idea that the individual is a developing thing and that we can see it in literature over time through language is extremely important for those listening uh, to know that people have not always been the same, nor have they always thought the same way. And the reason we know this is because in the literature and specifically in the poetry, language is, has shown a pattern of development and changes. And we can track that pattern of the development and those changes. And that shows us that although we look outside and we say, you know, it's still the same old world with, with evil, sin, hate, good, forces of light and darkness, there is something else, which is the human being over time, the consciousness of the human being has been changing. And we do know that because we see it in language. And, I, and that's where we can spot the I am. That's where we can spot the ick is in the, the function of language and the development of language and the ability to conceive of new things and unique things. Well, yeah, you have, for example, the testimony of Owen Barfield. And he has a book, History and Words, right? And yeah. He, it, actually, he had come up with the idea of the, uh, a metamorphosis of consciousness as represented in language independently and then encountered the work of Rudolf Steiner. And right. it was like, right. that was this big eureka moment. Yes. Because he had already, and, and elsewhere, I forget the, the author who, who did it, but uh, uh, there's a book on Homeric Greek. You know, and, and you talk about it because in Homer, they talk about the wine Red Sea. Yes. Now, last time I checked, the ocean wasn't uh, red, right? So, right. and Rudolf Steiner does in one point, I forget which lecture, but he makes reference to the change of the perception of colors that, that was uh, uh, active at that time in the ancient uh, Greeks. So yeah. you see that there's this transformation. And in, in the lecture cycle that Rudolf Steiner does on Dionysius, it's just absolutely spectacular when he starts getting into explaining Greek myths and legends and shows how the principles are represented by the Greek God so that you have Pluto is the, is the physical body, and then you have Zeus is like the astral body, and Neptune is the etheric body. And right. then he gets into that, and he gets into talking about uh, the the rape of Persephone represents the the coming into the physicality and losing the the inherent clairvoyant capacities that were gifted us. Yes. Yes, from from the the goddess, right, and that uh, Persephone, the, that whole cycle of of stories, and so you have Rudolf Steiner later in the initiation cycle in the last lecture. He talks about that there's this darkening of of some uh, uh, attribute of our humanness, and it has gone unconscious, and that is the doorway that gives access to the adversaries and, yes. and to be able to manipulate us through wrong thinking and urges and, and so many of the things that work in us unconsciously now because it didn't used to be that way, but now it is unconscious. And so that through uh, opening us to the divine through this, this future pointing faculty, we will be able to shed light and reclaim that which was lost. Yeah, that's uh, Barfield called, uh, what was the word he used? He called it final participation. He said the shamans were in the original participation state, which means they basically went out their body, went into visionary states, and then returned with different kinds of insight, wisdom, remote viewing, uh, insider stuff on what plants want and what they can do for you, that kind of thing. But in our intellectual development, we had to let that go 
so we could be the mad scientist in the lab and torture things and look at the secrets of matter. And hopefully we're going to evolve beyond needing to torture things to figure out what kills them, to know what makes them live and progress on to looking at things as living forms. And if we could study living things instead of dead things or killing things, we could get insight into the forces behind life. That would be the etheric science that is oncoming, as, as you know, John, and we're all rooting for that one. But that's going to bring us closer to having the sensibility of a shaman, but the intellect of a scientist. Yes, we, we, we get to keep uh, what we've developed and approach it in a new light. And, uh, but a good example of what you're referring, uh, the Aborigines' ability to, to, to sense and find water, like you know, travel miles and then go right to and dig down and there's, there's like uh, aquifer, like what you were referring to. But were they to, to go to college and start studying mathematics and astronomy and all this abstract science, they would lose that faculty. That, that that it would it would it would push it aside, and so you see that there that there's different facets of of uh, individual nature that have to be reapproached in a new way. You can't go back, and like a lot of people, they like to think they can go back and do what the ancients did as far as uh, to be able to come into a state of uh, revelation and mystery. But Rudolf Steiner is very clear that you no, know, you have to be able to move into the future with with the the future gifts that 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 we are fashioning out of our own strivings it's not yes. something that we're receiving passively from sure. from beings but that we're able to fashion out of our own uh, relation to the world i don't know how much time you have so i'm just wanna uh, we're one hour and seven minutes yeah uh, i just wanted to bring up uh Sometimes we have to go backward to go forward. And uh, I think that, that there are quite a few people who are old souls who've got to go dabble in the old shamanism to realize it doesn't quite function as it used to. When they let go of that, they'll, they'll make their way to the new shamanism, which will include the will and the intellect and, the, and interestingly, the physical body so that you get the extended perception without departing from the physical body and you get the inside of the intellect on the revelation instead of the departure from the intellect to get the revelation. So we're there and it's happening, but we are seeing a lot of confusion in our time because people don't like to think too much. You know, Abraham Lincoln said, if a dog had five tails, how many tails would it have? And someone said, uh, I don't know. And he said, well, the answer is it's, the, the whole thing's wrong. Dog doesn't have five tails. And, uh, they were taking a lawyer to come up with that one. So the, the whole point is that we, we get lost in a lot of useless thinking, but we really need to apply serious thinking. And Steiner said the truth wasn't simple. And I'm glad he said that because people love to pretend everything is simple because they're lazy. And it's important to overcome that and try to pursue things till you get to the actual uh, cause. And you look at the complexities behind even the simplest things because it'll really loosen you up and make you a little more tolerant for all the craziness that's happening. Yeah, but it's important to keep in mind, though, that, that, that it's through the archetype, the simple archetype that, that provides a bridge for, for our attunement to this higher destiny. And, and you shouldn't dissuade people from thinking that if they don't have a, get a PhD in spiritual science, they're not going to make the cut. That's not the point. No, not and, at all. Not and so uh, I, I go back to the I go back to Novalis, the the, the uh, great German romantic poet, and he said the highest and the purest is the most common and the most understandable. Hence, 
elementary geometry is higher than higher geometry. Mm -hmm. The more difficult and the more intricate a science, the more derived, the more impure, and the more mixed. Yeah. So that's the opposite side of it, that you have to be able to, to uh, capture the archetype, so to speak. That gives you somewhere to put all of this understanding. And that's, that's I, a big it, part of what anthroposophy has to offer for people. Yes, and in fact, uh, what I said to someone when they were leading me on the intellectual gamut, I said, but of course, ultimately, the final question is the faculty of devotion. And that is, what is the person devoted to in their search for trying to know the truth? What are they really devoted to? Whom? To whom are they devoted? To what are they devoted? And this is where you can be safe with simplicity, is the faculty of devotion, which is what every good scientist should be carrying with them into the lab. But alas, the bank account screams, and uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, this is great. I can see we're just we're just getting started here, my friend. <laughs> you know, and. Uh, so I, I hope you have time on your hands in the future because I'm going to be pulling on your toga. <laughs> All right. But uh, I, I, before we go, I want to uh, share uh, some details of, of our, our wonderful uh, friend here, uh, Robert Allen Pittman. What, what details would you like to share with our audience? Uh, oh, gosh. I'm... Uh... Uh, my website is a martial arts website mainly. That's alanpittman.com, A-L-L-E-N-P-I-T-T-M-A-N. -T -T but my life is shifting up, and I'm beginning work on a um, what I call the Castle Project, which is an attempt to classify and organize all the traditional wisdom traditions around the world. So it's a small bite-sized task, and it's going to take a while. And... Uh, that's where I'm going this year. So I'll back off from teaching and I'll still do consulting and do a little bit of training on the side, but most of my energies are gonna be pushed toward mapping, mapping of the wisdom traditions of the world that are still extant and see what's left. That's wonderful. Well, you might, you know, uh, Joseph Campbell has done a wonderful contribution in that regard and you might, uh, if you get near a, a well-stocked library, uh, you might find it there because it's a great big book and it has all the different uh, folklore and, and mythology of all the various oh, yeah. world cultures. I'm very, I'm very familiar with him. And uh, this, this is very connected to an old project I did about 20 years ago with the Mythic Imagination Institute. And I was doing security for all the speakers. There was over 100. And I got to speak with a lot of them as a result. But of course, Joseph Campbell's work was a, a big part of that conference. Um, so I'm basically extending that now to our archive preservation exploration institution and looking at funding and assemblage and organizational matters. And I'll see how far I get before I croak, you know. <laughs> but in, in light of all that, just to give uh, people perhaps something they could work on, uh, that the, the spiritual world responds more readily to the archetypes rather than to all this intellectual chatter we come up with, which is of, of really, uh, it's not, it's not going to, it's not going to serve you well in the next world. What one, one needs to do is, is gain kind of an archetypal relationship. So if you could, you know, uh, spend a, a few minutes a day, close your eyes, and try to imagine and hold in your imagination uh, the image of a circle and the image of a triangle and the image of a square. See if you can do that uh, for any extended period of time, and you'll see how much work you have to do to begin to, to uh, uh, function within the realm of imagination. And and that that's that whole faculty of being able to uh, work towards becoming a creative being. And we're right at this point. We've been created at the behest of the divine spiritual beings, and now we're like infants, and we're 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 
trying to uh, follow the lead that was laid out for us by Jesus Christ through his incarnation at the baptism and uh, for three years being able to uh, proceed according to that cosmic nature that's expressed in the first three years of childhood and that 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 that's that divine spiritual place that we were there we just don't remember see and so it's to be able to develop a conscious relationship to this world of the divine spiritual beings that's to me far more interesting than than uh, some of the things that people occupy their minds with and uh, but that it's up to them however they want to spend their time so yeah. I, I i want to mention of course i have two books unfortunately this one's out of print but i if i could carve out some time I would be able to get it back and print on demand is what I'm planning. It's some 640 pages. The Arcana of the Grail Angel, The Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail. A study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner, The Underground Streams of Esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the True Rosicrucian Order. And the second volume is The Arcana of Light on the Path. And uh, I have a whole series of these cosmological diagrams to serve as a memory theater so that you can come to a relationship with some of the things that, that we discuss regarding Rudolf Steiner's spiritual science. But you can still get this volume uh, if you, unfortunately I don't have an eBay link right now, but there's a link below for my academia page and you can contact me through there or on private message on Facebook and I can make arrangements even if you're outside the US. And if you wanna buy me a cup of coffee, that's uh, paypal.me forward slash John Barnwell 888. Do you have some kind of PayPal tag that you- I do. Have uh, Alan Pittman at Yahoo will uh, will PayPal me in the U.S. and R A Pittman thirty nine at Gmail will PayPal me here in UK. Okay, so take take risk as you will. Yeah, but uh, I always enjoy a a nice hot cup of coffee. Anyways, any the, and nothing's too small. But uh, so I guess we have uh, our work cut out for us, my friend. The, we we've. We've traveled into some pretty deep water, and we've only got just got started. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thank you so much. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.